Hello and welcome. Welcome. We're going to get started at two o'clock on the dot. You're in the right place. You are in the right place. Hello everyone, welcome. You're in the right place. We're going to get started right at two o'clock. Good afternoon, Brian Schneckenberger's here from Baltimore County Public Schools. Good to see you. Say hi to us in the chat if you're here. Everyone can see the chat, so it's a great place to connect and say hello. There is a program booklet for today's session. If you'd like to see the run of show, some of our MSDE resources, and bios for all of our presenters, you can find it there. And that program booklet, the link is in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Pamela. <laughs> Prentice is here. Good afternoon to you. Hi, Andrew and Victoria. Michael Bell's here from Queen Anne's County Public Schools. It's good to see you. Dave Hastings is here. Yay! That's great. Steven's here. That's great. Steven, let me know if you're good. Do you need a, a, a little dress rehearsal piece or are you good? Just let me know. Hi, Carol. Good to see you from the Baltimore Symphony. It's great to see you. Cantante chamber singers. Yeah, absolutely, Victoria. We all have so much to learn from each other, right? Adult and youth choirs alike, educators and pros. Hi, Allison G from Imagination Stage. Great. Thank you, Stephen. We're going to begin right at 2 o'clock. And if you, I'm gonna give a little orientation on how to use Crowdcast. So you'll see we have an active chat going and it's a great place to connect, to drop in um, comments to each other. Also to encourage the panelists, um, if you hear something, use that emoji bar. Really kind of, you know, speak to us. Let's keep this interactive. Hi, Larry Kelly from Encore Creativity for Older Adults. It's fantastic. We love creative aging here in Maryland. It's wonderful. Brittany Jordan's here from Wacomico. If you have questions to ask, uh, we have a really fast-paced session planned. So the questions that you put in the ask a question will be questions that will help us formulate our next webinar. So if you have a question, you can pose it there. And you can also vote if there's a question that's already been listed that you also agree with. You can just vote for that question to rise to the top as one of the most prominent questions. If we have time for questions today, oh, Joanne, Kuliz is here. My teacher from grad school. Good to see you. Awesome. Wonderful. Hi, Marlo. So if you have a question, you can stick it there. And please vote. If there's a question you know that's already been asked that you're interested in, vote for it. 
we will um, do our best to then use those questions for our next webinar series, okay? Just letting you know that we won't have quest time for questions to the audience today um, because of the size of our panel. We have a lot of information to share with you and uh, we value your questions. And we will have another session in weeks to come that explores questions and also gives you an opportunity to ask questions directly to the Fine Arts Office. Hi, Amy. Good to see you. Amy Kahn's here from Baltimore County Public Schools. Sybil from PGCPS is here. Sherry Mervine made it. Great to see you. And Marlo's here from Prince George's. So good to see you. Irina Bakis is here from Sister Cities Girl Choir. Awesome. It's great to see you. So we're going to get started in a, in a moment. Stephen Baudouin is here from the Washington Chorus. We have an incredible panel for you all. I'm going to put the link again in the chat with our program booklet. Actually, it won't let me, so you'll need to go up to the top. Let me try again. There we go. There's the link. Link to our program booklet if you want to see the run of show, you want to see the presenters. Hi, Wendy Broadwater. Good to see you. Yes. Marlo is sending Deanna kisses. I love it. Maryland is such a great place. Such a great place. Everyone, everyone is always so warm and welcoming to each other. And we all support each other. Wow, we've got a lot of people here. We're pushing up to 100. We've got 100 people here. Oh, thank you, Judith. <laughs> thank you. Tim Bodemer's here from Calvert, from no, Charles County Public Schools. Doug Byerly is here. My Baltimore County Public School high school choir teacher is here, Doug Byerly. Fantastic. So great. All right, we're getting started. It's 1.59. So I'm going to silence this music. Hopefully you enjoyed it. A little chill hop to start us off. And welcome you. Welcome to Embrace, the professional learning series that looks at ways that arts educators, teaching artists, and non-arts educators that use arts integration strategies in their classroom, our arts education creative workforce, can remain open, curious, and reflective during COVID-19 and recovery. Today's session is unlike any other Embrace session we've had before. We have a a, a put together a panel of choral leaders, arts leaders and education leaders to talk about their plans for how the, they're thinking about the planning, perhaps the reimagining of the 2020-2021 choral season. We're going to begin with our panel number one, our online learning panel who's going to come and talk to us about what they've seen so far in the field. So I'm happy to welcome up Welcome up the following three folks. We have Michael Bell, the Fine Arts Supervisor of Queen Anne's Public, County Public Schools. We have Terry Eberhardt, who is the Coordinator of Music for Howard County Public Schools. And we have Judith Hawkins. We type her name in here. And Judith is coming to us from Prince George's County Public Schools. Here we go. We're all here in the room together. It's great to see you. Judith is our supervisor of vocal and general music. Great, it's wonderful to see you guys. Good to be Thank here. Thank you, it's great to be here. Great to be wow. here, Alicia. Awesome, so let's break, Let's get jump right in. So mm -hmm. due to COVID-19 and the rapid closure of Maryland public schools, mm -hmm. local school systems immediately launched into continuity of learning plans and the Arts, of course, as we know, are an essential content area. They are a part of a well-rounded education in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, Judith, what do you see as the benefits of making sure that continuity of learning includes vocal music? Well, um, I am a singer, and that's how I got started in this whole music education 
is. And so for me, that for singing means to stifle my voice. I mean, we already have this instrument within us. I say, why not use it to its fullest extent? And so while I was looking for things, you know, spiffy to say today, I noticed this quote by Miguel Cervantes and it says, he who sings scares away his woes. Oh, and I yeah. think that is essential for what we do with students each and every day. We give students a voice to share their sorrow their joys and their anxieties. And if we look throughout history, every social movement has had some kind of singing or song tied to it that unified people that expressed their message without even so much as a sign. Hello. And so we, we, we want to instill that kind of creativity and expression with students and even keep that alive within us as the educators, because once our flame dies out, how can we expect to ignite a student if we are no longer a practicer or no longer an artist and no longer a musician in, uh, in practice? And besides all of this, why we want to keep singing is because it gives students a chance to survey the entire world and turn them on to cultures and people and other sounds that they may never have been exposed to in their lives. I mean, in my own personal background, my dad was the church musician. Needless to say, we had a lot of gospel in my house. Yeah. But we also heard things like Ima Subak, and don't nobody know who that is. It's is really Amy Camus, and she was uh, <laughs> some kind of exotic singer back in the 50s and 60s. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but we had all of that in my house. And so I grew up singing, loving to sing, loving to hear music from all over the world. And that's what we are charged to do as music educators, to ignite that fire for singing and, and to have that joy of singing still alive in our students and in us and to keep our voices relevant through singing. Absolutely, wow, wow. what a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. um, and that is so wonderful. You know, part of putting this group of people together, the three of you, was really to see the perspectives. You know, Prince George's is a very large school system mm -hmm. and Howard County is a, is a medium-sized system. And then we've got a small system over with Queen Anne. Mm -hmm. uh, are you guys seeing something similar in Queen Anne's that vocal music is helping students during these uncertain times? Oh, it definitely is, Alicia. Mm -hmm. You know, just the act of singing alone, it allows our teachers and our students to just breathe. You know, it's yeah. it's that it's that release that they need. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the kids out there, they've been overloaded and they need a safe space to go to. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, while it's also a release, it's also become the greatest release because it's been a true gift that we're giving through our teachers, through our students and their families, that they're continuing to sing and they're uplifting others through these collaborations and the things that we're doing, just like we're doing right here. I mean, it's 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 played an integral role. That's fantastic. You know, I often, when I think about choral singers, um, I often think about how independent they can be. And so in times like these, right, where we're really asking students to work um, and flex their independent learning muscles, I see choral students really being able to rise to that occasion. You know, this makes me think as well about so many artists during this time have really been sharing their stories and their skills and talents with the world. I've attended, um, I got to dance and party with DJ Nice and Michelle Obama a couple weeks ago. And <laughs> that's a memory I'll cherish forever. And so they're really helping us to cope with the uncertainty of these present times. Um, one of our top recommendations for educators is to craft learning experiences that allow students to document and share stories and diverse perspectives during these times, during COVID-19 and of course the recovery. Terry from Howard County, will you tell us how are students using creative responses to share their stories through vocal music? Yeah, this is this is an amazing time for, for our students in Howard County and, and across the nation. I, I think it's an, an opportunity for us to really showcase what they have been learning in their choral classes. And if you take five minutes on social media, you're you're bound to see kids singing, um, you know, or if the rage right now is TikTok. <laughs> and every time you turn on TikTok, you see somebody singing or making or making something creative, which is mm -hmm. so incredibly important and powerful. Um, I think for us, it's it's been an awesome opportunity for us to really showcase individual students 
and having them submit their their recordings, if, whether it be during virtual pieces or um, mm -hmm. in in challenges that teachers are able to create, and then having them submit those to their instructors is allowing the teachers to see the kids in a new light. A lot of mm -hmm. times, kids in in chorus will um, you know they'll hide <laughs> because they'll be in a chorus of seventy singers, and you won't necessarily get to hear them. But when you have them all submit an assignment where they have to add their voice to a virtual choir or anything like that, you start to really understand and the teacher starts to, to, to have a little bit more intimacy with each of those voices and be able to provide them with some specific feedback. For us, we have um, been showcasing student work with a Weebly page that is collecting um, some exemplars from schools throughout our system. Uh, we have 72 schools in Howard County, which does make us a medium sized school and um, allowing each of our secondary schools to to submit a, a performance of their students, whether it be a singer songwriter or that's collaborating with a different student or whether it be a virtual choir has been an amazing opportunity for us. It allows the community to see firsthand what the students are doing. It also allows the teachers to showcase exactly what the kids are learning. Um, because I mean, you know, it, it only takes, well, if, if you dig deep, there's always an amazing educator that has supplied the resources or the tool or the how to, to get that awesome product out of a student. So we always want to be able to lift up the student artwork as, um, you know, this is a creation that they have made, but also the, the skill that has gone into training them and teaching them how to use those skills to, to be expressive. Because we know the arts are, essential, are an essential right for every child's learning and cognitive development. This is absolutely a way for our students to showcase that they are creative problem solvers. Um, so for us, it, it, it's, been, it's been a powerful opportunity for us to showcase the work that our kids are um, creating. And we're using, we're using all those technologies that, that I mentioned, you know, we're, we're tapping into TikTok, we're tapping into, um, you know, uh, Soundtrap is a big one. I think through all the school systems, everybody's kind of seeing the collaborative nature of Soundtrap. And we're, we're, we're taking those platforms and allowing kids to have access. And it's great that it's free right now. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a great time for us, mm -hmm. I think. That's fantastic that, you know, it sounds like there's some learning happening that when we go back to in-person learning, some of these things will 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 we'll bring back with us. You know, this Absolutely. idea of, um, I'd, I'd joined choir maybe even to hide my voice a little bit, right? But this idea of using technology in a more deep way to assess kids and to drive their learning, to elevate their work. Um, I think teachers will feel a lot more comfortable with a lot of the platforms that are out there when we return, it sounds like. Yeah, that's the that's the hope and the goal is, you know, I mean, I, I started playing around with the programs as soon as we came out because I wanted to be able to, to, to know exactly what I was telling teachers to work with Got it. and I wanted to be able to troubleshoot and know that the products were actually going to be able to allow kids to do the things that they do in chorus and I know that everybody there are a lot of people that are saying oh there's no way to replicate there are ways there are ways to come close to it and um, we're going to find those ways because kids need it yeah. um, because our communities need it and because mm -hmm. our um, our arts industry needs us to be on it right now That's so right. we're going to figure it out and we're going to be at the front of it innovation, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so Michael, will you tell us about in Queen Anne's? How are you seeing children, students, or students there sharing their stories or sharing stories from their community through vocal music? Sure. I mean, from day one in Queen Anne's County, we're a tight knit group and it, being a small district, I mean, we are first and foremost in the relationship business. Mm. And so this pandemic, we've found very creative ways through our teachers. I give them all the kudos in the world for the hard work that they've that they've done. We've done it through challenges. And like Terry was saying, you know, challenges have been so integral to part of our process. Mm -hmm. And we started it with a community wide across the whole district. Uh, we did a challenge called times like these, but instead of setting it to the backdrop of Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, we brought in a Queen Anne's County high former grad, Dana Cox, who delivered the cover song that kids could sing along to and also submit their artwork, submit their, you know, all the different things that they're being creative around. Awesome. That was a very emotional one. And it was a very emotional piece because it, this happened very early on, right when students went home. And to back that up, we came out with a sequel with high hopes and dancers, choral students, I mean, you name it, they all sang along to it. And we compiled this huge clip 
And we put it, we keep putting it out there to the community to show the community that these kids, I mean, not only do they miss their togetherness, mm -hmm. but they also miss the recognition, the recognition from a teacher, just a little pat on the back, just a little in-person thing. So being able to reward them through putting them out there uh, in the community with these challenges has really proved to be very rewarding for those kids, for those teachers, and continue giving them a voice for all that the social emotional piece that is so important during times like these. Michael, I'm hoping when you go, when I send you back to the audience that you'll drop in the chat, the links to both of those videos, sure. people would love to see them. I've Happy. watched High Hope several times. It's very <laughs> inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's so great fun. <laughs> different ages of kids, um, you know, really feeling confident enough to, to independently stand and uh, stand up for their community and be a, a source of inspiration. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna return you to our rooms and we thank you so much for sharing the work. And I would be remiss to say, we have an incredible network of fine arts supervisors in the state of Maryland who have right away jumped in with, with vigor and, uh, and passion and also of course, deep expertise to support teachers. And so we are so grateful for all of you. And of course, we're grateful to the teachers who on a dime turned around to support the needs of students all throughout Maryland. So kudos to all of you supervisors. Thank you so much for your focus and also to our teachers. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. If you are looking for Maryland Fine Arts resources, we would encourage you to visit um, to, to download this program booklet, the links are in the chat for the booklet. And we are constantly um, updating our website with professional development resources. Every week we put out a roundup of all of the professional learning available internationally for fine arts educators. So if you're stuck and you're looking for some resources and free trainings, we only publish free trainings. Um, please look there, look to our website every week and we'll drop the link in the chat in a moment. There we go, thank you collaboration. All right, we're moving forward with to panel two. So panel two is going to be, we have three distinguished guests. We have Shane Jensen from Baltimore County Public Schools. And Shane is the music specialist in Baltimore County. We also have Sybil Roseborough who is our instructional specialist for Prince George's County Public Schools. And we have Jeffrey Winfield, who is our supervisor of fine arts. Looking for you, Jeff. Jeff, can you say hi in the chat and then I'll be able to find you easier. And find Jeff. Found Jeff, gotcha. Jeffrey Winfield, our supervisor of fine arts for Harford County Public Schools. Hello, hello Shane, hello Sybil. Jeff is on his way in. Great, we're all here, how fantastic. So I, we're gonna get started right away. Um, the Maryland, the MSDE Maryland Together Report, which was shared a few weeks ago from Dr. Salmon, shares that Maryland schools will look very different in fall 2020. Arts instruction is an essential part of a public school education in Maryland and should continue in distance learning, hybrid learning, and in-person learning models. And MSD is, is proud to support that. The network of Maryland Fine Arts Supervisors have worked collaboratively to prepare a document to support fine arts programs in Maryland public schools. And so our next three guests are committee members from the Arts Together Document Committee. A link to that document is in your program booklet, so please check it out. It is an incredible resource for every arts discipline in Maryland, and it has a list of general recommendations and specific recommendations divided by discipline. The document is meant to be shared with all arts education stakeholders and used to launch arts educators into planning for the year ahead with the understanding that each local school system will have its own procedures and models based on their resources in their local community due to the nature of this pandemic. If you're looking for some overarching guidelines, you can turn to page five in the document and look, page seven, I'm sorry, and look at our five guiding principles. So Shane, one of our first um, guiding principles for the document for Arts Together is that arts educators should continue to teach in their content. 
Will you tell us a little bit about that? Why is that important um, during yeah, uh, yeah. during this time? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's important that we we do continue. Um, but you know, we continue to teach. Um, you know, in, in the platform when we come back to that we're adhering to our you know our physical distancing guidelines, everything that's out there. Um, in our, you know, with the procedures with physical space that we can clean, disinfect, um, you know, and following all the protocols um, with it. But it's it's really important to to keep understanding that you know the arts are uh, such an important part of our, our public school education here, um, and that's gonna it's gonna look different and it, distance learning, hybrid, in person. Um, and I'm seeing the like, questions of when are we getting back? I would love to have everybody back and and go back in, but it's gonna look different. Um, it's gonna be shaped different. Um, yes. Terry brought something up in the last one that we are going to and required to be more creative. It will look different, but you know, our challenge is also how can we be more innovative and yes. keep sharing what these classrooms look like. And I think that's the power of what we have and we can share that. And I think that's gonna keep our, our, our drive and our importance of going of why we need to keep teaching in this content and what it means to to have that outlet um, and that creativity. So keep sharing, keep being creative, keep being innovative. Absolutely, so important. You know, Maryland has made a profound commitment. We stand on the shoulders, of course, of so many advocates through the years have, who have made sure that arts education policies in Maryland are strong and supportive, right? Um, so we're so lucky in that regard. And, and so it's people like you uh, and, and this group here that are making sure that um, we are innovatively addressing um, that need and that that continues despite our distance and despite um, some of the ways that learning is challenging in this time. Sybil, will you talk to us? Um, our second uh, principle <laughs> is that there should be curricular options for all artistic processes. So that's creating, performing, responding, and connecting, and that those processes can be delivered in all environments. So hybrid, in-person, or distance learning. How are you seeing that showing up? Um, is that a challenge for, for folks to be able to make sure all of the standards are covered? Well, first and foremost, before we talk that, I think it's important that fine arts classrooms should remain dedicated to teaching and learning in the art form. Mm -hmm. and the artistic processes, being a creative, performing, responding, connecting, can be delivered in all environments. That's including what was mentioned earlier about Shane, by Shane, remote learning, which we're doing currently, hybrid learning, which will be the combination of teaching from home as opposed to being in the classroom and in-person learning with our traditional approach where we're there in the school building. And what we'll have to do is reimagine how we're gonna do this. And that would be distance learning during instruction, avoiding the use of shared materials and providing for continuity of instructions. We're gonna really have to articulate that for each of the LSSs on what that's gonna look like for our particular art form because it's viable and it should under no conditions be repurposed for anything else. We need vocal music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope you guys, we have the best supervisors in the country in Maryland, and they are strong advocates for their programs. They provide a deep well of expertise to support teachers, and they understand the benefits and the crucial nature of arts education continuing in this time. Yeah. Um, Jeff. So our third principle here is sharing student work continues with modifications for digital platforms or physical distancing. Why is it important that we continue to have the presentation of student work despite the need for physical distancing or perhaps um, you know, the, the uh, removal of uh, in-person uh, events in the future? Thank you, Alicia. This is not only important, but it's vital for our choral programs to keep students engaged because I think that's where we've kind of dropped a little um, and, and understandably so, we, but we want them to remain excited about singing. The format that we're gonna use in the future is obviously going to not be traditional. And that's where we're going to have to uh, um, tap into our, our creative geniuses and the, what greater place than the arts for all the creative geniuses. So I encourage you to tap into your own amazing brain and those of your colleagues um, to find venues that will work um, in this time of our transition because we know that's gonna be the important part. Um, these virtual choir performances that we're seeing all over social media are amazing and they're great exposure, but we as educators know they're not authentic learning experiences because you're not having that, that important um, process of working with and singing with 
those that are in a room with you. So don't be discouraged by this. Even though they look and they sound amazing, don't be discouraged. Um, using safe distancing guidelines that will be provided by your LEA. Think about creating small groups or solo performances similar to our colleagues in the visual art and set up a virtual ex exhibition um, using recorded performances from your students and send it out to your school and your community. That, that's really vital that they see that. Think also about tapping into your school district resources that were used for virtual or digital graduations. So they have the, they have the manpower, they know how that works. Tap into that. Another great idea I think is if you have a studio, a TV studio in your school or one in your district, connect with those professionals and find ways that you can then um, send out performances that you may have um, recorded from last year. Ah, so you're, you're keeping out there. The, I think the important thing is that we stay connected with our community so that they know that we're vibrant and we're alive and we can't wait to get back together. But um, really important to connect that way and, and be positive, be a passionate advocate not necessarily a zealot, um, because that's that's what we need. We need that positive connection right now. And I think that will really help in moving us forward. Absolutely, that's a great point. Um, Shane, we see that teachers uh, in the future, we're going to need, and by the future, I mean tomorrow, <laughs> teachers <laughs> are, and staff are gonna need training in the proper sanitization of materials and physical spaces. What might that look like for choral and uh, vocal music folks? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, Jeff hit on a good point of, you know, we, we have to keep stuff going, but we also want to keep students, staff, everybody safe. Um, that is primary goal for for um, when we're back indoor spaces, what, you know, and what does that look like? So, you know, like with all the other disciplines, all the other arts, um, to make sure that, you know, that we're maintaining our physical classrooms um, with, a, you know, again, it's the distancing, it's the, the cleaning procedures, um, but you know the guidance from local officials, our administrators, the supervisors, everybody in your content area, school leaders, teachers, stakeholders, everything in there, to you know, to really develop that plan. Um, that is you know, and and we'll use this I, again. We'll use this document. But I you know we had a great discussion the other day about you know just things that sometimes you take for granted of just wiping your keyboard down. Yeah. Um, you know just just you know are we following all of this? Because you know th there are times we took a lot for granted of just. Um, of keeping spaces clean. So, Absolutely. you know, to constantly examine and, and going back to Jeff's, uh, you know, distance, and it might look just, you know, different of, are we doing hybrids online with sectionals? Like be creative in that space. Um, but, you know, just to be knowledgeable when, once we get in what that's gonna look like and, and to keep those standards going. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this doesn't, you know, happen and it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. It's That's going right. to be different. It's going to be so different. And each school system is developing uh, a plan for the sanitization of spaces and equipment based off of, you know, the equipment that they choose to use, the vendors that they choose to, to deal with. So your school system will have a very robust training um, and very robust procedure for all of this, including things like what happens if someone in our building gets sick. Each school system is developing plans for that. So you will have that support. Sybil, can you talk to us about student engagement and supporting student engagement in and through the arts is one of our key principles. And why is that important? Student engagement in and through the arts is important for the following reasons. One being that fine arts education is a right and not a privilege. With that being said, fine arts educators are encouraged to design lessons with all learners in mind and to engage students in meaningful ways. Therefore, to increase capacity of instruction, professional learning may consist of the following, using digital um, with an arts focus, such as vocal tracks, online music resources for practicing sight singing, vocalization, for assessments, for small group, whole group instruction, virtual performances and concerts, which we've heard earlier, and mm -hmm. also use not best practices that we can use in class as well as online, universal design for learning, for adaptive learning, translation of text and large print highlighting text, differentiation of instruction. These tools and best practices help support the whole child through social and emotional learning centered in the arts 
and culturally responsive arts education. And these are the things we're gonna need to articulate to each of our LSs where that money and support will be provided for the teachers to be able to get the optimal uh, learning opportunities for students. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sybil. And Jeffrey, we want to turn every, I see some questions. Someone asked about copyrights and things like that. We have that information in the Arts Together report. So we want to encourage folks to check that out. So can you tell us, Jeffrey, what, what else can we expect to see in the report when people dig into it? Well, first off, I'd like to say that this is a living, breathing document. It's only the beginning. It's not the end. It's not a prescription. It's a guideline and many guidelines. And included in that, we have teaching and learning, maintaining distance, accommodations for smaller student groups, materials and supplies, sanitization, staffing, scheduling, large group gatherings, and most importantly, professional learning opportunities for the teachers. And, and all of our disciplines in the arts are set up this way. Um, if you hadn't had a chance to check it out, it's on page 37. Um, in our guideline, and it, it's a it's a great start. But please, we encourage your feedback because we want to make it more. Uh, we want this to be the guideline for Maryland, but we want to hear from you as well. So understand, it's not an ending point. We're just beginning. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, when we started this journey a few weeks ago, we got this report done in the three and a half weeks. Um, thanks to the dedication and, um, and expertise and also the amount of research that all of you guys were willing to put into making this report so robust. Updates are coming. We have monthly meetings set up to update the report continuously as new things arise, as new information arises. And I want to thank you on behalf of all of Maryland for your dedication to students and to teachers. You, the work that you do is so critical and vital. And so we, we're grateful that you showed up in such a big way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thank soon. You, All right. We are moving on to panel three. Again, um, I would definitely, you know, just remind you to check out the report. It, it is 50 pages, but just look, read the general guidelines and read the vocal choral music first to start. Um, that might be, you know, a total of maybe 15 pages. And there, you'll find a lot of information there that will be very supportive, very supportive. All right, next we have a panel that's gonna talk to us about the ways that they're planning, reimagining, and possibly repurposing the upcoming performance season. So we're gonna talk just about performances. We have an incredible cast of folks here. We have Stephen Boudouin, who is the executive director of the Washington Chorus. We have JJ Norman, who is our new executive director of Maryland Music, the Maryland Music Educators Association. And we have Deanna Saez, who is the legendary director of choral studies. Oh, it looks like we may have lost Deanna. Deanna, if you're here, will you put a note in the chat? We can find you. There you are, found you. Awesome. Deanna Saez, who's the director of choral studies for Towson University. Hello. I can't believe, first of all, we're running on time. <laughs> it's like perfect. <laughs> well, that's really great. So we have the three of you here, and I just want to give a little disclaimer before you even begin, so you can feel free to speak, you know, speak freely, that the three of you are representing very three very different organizations. And um, and that you are um, not, of course, being prescriptive in any way. Deanna is coming. Um, not being prescriptive anyway, you're going to share exactly, you know, your personal views and what's happening at your institution. Hopefully people can be inspired by those ideas, right? Awesome. All right. So let's start with Stephen. Stephen, how is the Washington Chorus planning for reimagining or repurposing the upcoming performance season? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great. Uh, so thank you for the invite. No one has commented on your rainbow chair. So let me first be the one to comment yeah. on that amazing rainbow chair. I hate to I hate to correct you in front of a hundred people, Stephen, but it's actually a throne. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As well it should be. Thank you. Uh, it's <laughs> Well, so we're, we're at the Washington Chorus. Um, so uh, we believe our world is better when we sing and create together. And so we, we're trying to be as creative as possible in this moment. Um, and, and here, are, I'm gonna give a couple examples of how we're doing this. Um, so uh, 
virtual choir. So, of course, all of you, and we've heard some great examples, are, are talking and thinking about virtual choir. But one way that we're trying to really think uh, about virtual choir plus is in two ways. So one is commissioning works for virtual choir. So how singers sing in a virtual choir, how they learn uh, is different. It just is different when you're at home. So and how composers write when you can't rehearse together is also going to be different. So we are commissioning three composers uh, including uh, Damien Geeter. You're hearing this before the public knows this. This Damien is brilliant. Geeter. Yeah, brilliant. Damien Geeter, Bob Schaefer, and then a third composer to be announced soon. We're commissioning new works specifically to be written for virtual choirs so that singers can sing them at home and that they can be uh, recorded. And the second piece, in addition to commissioning, is that the visual component is so important. And already I've been very inspired by the examples that people have shown of schools doing visual storytelling uh, with virtual choir pieces. And, and I, that's the way to go. We're in a, a moment where there's so much visual storytelling happening. So and we are actually going to commission a filmmaker to work with Damien Geeter to create a new film with virtual choir that we will premiere in November. This relates to the second part of how we're planning for the season is that we're thinking not only of monetizing, but ways, uh, monetizing and democratizing. So ways that we can monetize what we're doing through uh, programs like Anywhere Seat. Uh, there are a couple other programs out there that provide a paywall service between the individual and the content they want to get. Also finding ways to just uh, open the floodgates. Let's, let's democratize the art. And, and the benefit of this moment is that we're not limited by capacity. It's right. not that we fit 2,200 people in a hall. We can have 10,000 people online. Right. So let's let's find ways to have open sings. Let's find ways to have young singers. And this is a place where we're open for business. We want to partner with schools and understand what do schools need in this moment, because our education programs are going to be different. Things that we had always done, like DC Honor Course, we, we probably can't do those things right now. So we want to hear from schools about how we, especially with our new artistic director, Dr. Eugene Rogers, how can Hooray! we be a great partner to schools? That's fantastic. And yes, um, everyone should know they have a new artistic director at the Washington Chorus, Dr. Eugene Rogers. And so Stephen and Eugene as a combo, I mean, I, I can't wait to see what happens, right? Um, very right. exciting. Yeah, that was cool. That shows you. I love that innovative approach to thinking about new ways. It reminds me very much of some things we saw in the theater world where they started creating new plays, right? That looked at the at the new platform. So this idea for music makers to start to do that is I have not heard anyone else say that. So I'm gonna credit it to your brilliant brain and the work of the, your team. So thank you, Stephen. All right, let's hear from um, Dr. Diana, Deanna Sayans. Will you share with us what's happening at Towson University? How are you preparing for the year ahead? What are you thinking of for what will happen with your choir? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Good. Whew. Okay. You know, this is time when, when the challenges are huge, they're big, but at the same time, the opportunities are even bigger. So I'm going to share with you um, what I learned from my students uh, from the last few weeks while we were in quarantine. I'm going to be um, quoting them. They, they told me, being in a choir is less about the music and more about the sense of community and togetherness. Yeah. And others said that the musical bond is a lot harder to break than it seems. And it, uh, I'm still quoting, while we do not have the privilege of performing together right now, we are still able to create music. We learn how to adapt, to think outside the box, to get things done. And we have continued to let music to be a light in a dark time which has been very inspirational. These are words from my students. Beautiful. So as you can see, what we what they needed was a sense of community and, and, they, and staying together, right? So what are gonna be the challenges next semester? Obviously we won't be able to gather in big groups and sing together as we used to. Uh, we'll have to use masks. Maybe I'll have to get a plastic shield, you know, and, and we'll have to keep social distancing. Now, um, how our performance season is going to look? We have no idea, honestly. But I know that we'll, I will keep using Zoom for my sectionals and rehearsals. Uh, if I have face-to-face -face rehearsals, it would have to be in smaller groups. Mm. Uh, um, and 
obviously, I, I now that we learn, I'll keep working on, on visual performances, performances so we can post those online. Uh, that there was so much that we learned out of that last semester. But we'll also have the opportunity for to open and incentivize the student creativity to become more reflective practitioners, to create spaces for learning, for active learning. And in the case of Towson, eh, I've already spoken with a music composition teacher to explore the way in which we can collaborate and maybe create some aleatory music using technology. How um, exciting. Very, um, practice rehearsing and performing outside even if it is only one piece outside of the of the building i'm i'm thinking about using uh, in a uh, using improvisation explore improvisation a uh, body percussion i was thinking maybe together we can we can create a composition just using body percussion so we don't have to use our, our voice yes. uh, and you know what we are in a historical crossroad in our country right now so this is the best time to use a rehearsal and performance time to learn about music related to social justice uh -huh. and to people. So that's definitely part of, that's going to be part of my of my um, of my teaching next semester. And what's important, I think, is that we acknowledge that things are not going to go the way we plan, and that we have to keep the flexibility and the nimbleness and find ways to create the same level of excitement and togetherness for our students. Fantastic. Wow. I cannot wait to come to the performance of the Body Percussion Concerto outside, outdoor. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Thinking about new ways that choral singers can still come together to make music safely um, is a really great approach. I love that so much. Thank you so much and for sharing those beautiful words from your students about um, that really helps us to all think about the, the really the essential parts of art making, right? It's about humanity and relationships, yeah. JJ Norman, let's hear from you, our new executive director of music, of Maryland Music Educators Association. We're so glad to uh, hopefully give you your Maryland TV debut. I don't know. If yes, that's okay, absolutely, right. it is. Awesome, it so is. MMEA, of course, produces enormous concerts, um, I, I would think there would be thousands of children a year, probably, right? Is that kind of the number? Sure. Um, what are you guys thinking of in preparing for the upcoming season? First of all, thank you uh, to you, Alicia, for having me here and, and for the Department of Education for including uh, MMEA in this conversation. We are, of course, having to adapt everything. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of bringing thousands of people simply shouldn't be an idea, right? Um, so we are looking for ways to ensure that students still have connections to comments and feedback and adjudication from professionals. Wow. Um, we're focusing on the process, of course, rather than the product um, and ensuring that the students are connected. Um, if that is um, an audition, if that is um, a solo or ensemble adjudication, we're looking at how we make all of those different events that happen at various points across the calendar um, accessible to everyone. And we honestly feel that this is giving uh, Maryland MEA the opportunity to um, provide greater equity of access to students across the state Absolutely. who perhaps would not have been able to or felt comfortable or had the resources to travel to an audition site or uh, whatever it, it may have been. So we're thinking that um, student participation is going to go up as we yes. lessen the barrier, uh, whatever that may be for the students. Uh, but of course, with that, we have the responsibility to ensure um, that students have equitable access to technology, if that's hardware or software or um, or it just simply internet access. Um, and we're going to be working closely with each of the state fine arts supervisors to work out um, scenarios that work in each individual case. Um, depending if if a county in one section of the state may be full back in their school building, another one may be hybrid, and others still may be 100% online um, as we roll through this next school year. So we're going to have to have very targeted approaches uh, as we we find ourselves in in different uh, different scenarios for different students and teachers. Um, we're also really really excited beyond the performance aspect. What we do with students. We of course have a great mission to support um, 
music educators and their professional learning uh, in Maryland. And so while I'm not at liberty to say just yet <laughs> what we have going on, uh, you will be uh, you will be hearing from us in the next couple of days on a big announcement for a professional development event that MMEA will be hosting over the summer. Uh, that we're we're looking forward to bringing national voices uh, to the conversation and, and approaching overarching topics that will apply to every music educator in the state, but of course through a, a very focused contemporary lens uh, that we are, li are living through today. So just a bit of a teaser uh, and, and watch your inbox Friday over the weekend, Monday sometime for an announcement about a big PD event. That's incredible. That's so great. So I love hearing this, this idea that we may be able to, um, in light of this, these uncertain times, we may be able to address equity in a more equitable way, right? And yeah. that's very exciting uh, by giving students the opportunity to engage all from where they are, I think sounds so wonderful. And I also heard, heard in there something about, um, you know, how we wanna make sure we're supporting teachers and that that, is, that continues, right? So the mission for all three of you, the mission of your work continues despite the distance that is um, that is apparent, right? The mission continues. I wanna thank the three of you. Thank you, Stephen from the Washington Course. Thank you, Deanna Sayas from Towson University. And thank you, JJ Norman from MMEA for sharing your plans with us. And we look forward now to seeing what comes, um, I think with a little more hope and optimism for what's possible for the choir field. So this was very powerful to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna bring up our final panel for the day. And um, you know, I just wanna share with everyone, until large group gatherings are deemed safe by local officials, Maryland fine arts educators should be supported in creating exhibits, showcases, performances, concerts that can be delivered in a remote environment or maintain physical distance according to the local school system policies. So prevent, presenting and performing are key elements of a Maryland fine arts education. And we've seen that this can be delivered using digital tools, using remote learning platforms and other methods that allow for sharing and showing of work while following local regulations. If you are looking for platforms that you'd like to experiment with, we'd, we would encourage you to visit the MSDE fine arts resource page where there is a listing of platforms divided by discipline. If you're looking for arts activities, arts education activities, learning plan, lesson plans, learning goals, lesson seeds, those kinds of things, or also vendors who are offering programming for free. New York City Ballet, for instance, is uh, offering tons of their work for free. The Met was offering performances for free. Uh, the Washington Chorus has free programming. If you're looking for those kinds of things, you can also visit MSD's Fine Arts office page, um, which is all in our program booklet there. And the link right there is right there for you with those resources. So we encourage you to visit there. Next, I'm going to bring up a special guest. This is so exciting. We're going to bring up teacher Angelica Brooks, who is our Prince George's County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. <laughs> How exciting. She's on her way up. And we're so grateful to have her with us. Hello, Angelica. Hi, how are you? Great, great to see you. Great to see you, thank you for having me. So we're ending with teachers, right? This is, uh, we are, you know, the State Department well, my personal opinion is teachers are the most uh, brilliant people in the world. I come from a long line of teachers. And um, and as much as I believe that, I think Maryland has the best teachers. So uh, we're ending here talking about teachers. So will you talk to me a little bit about how remote learning has impacted teaching and learning? What are you seeing when, with your students? Wow. So um, I know it's been called distance learning. I, I really consider it um, physical distance learning. But in actuality, I feel like this experience has actually brought my students and myself much closer together. We have definitely uh, grown closer through this experience. We've had more authentic experiences, uh, learning music, sharing music because of the physical distance. Mm. It, it really has been an enlightening period 
in music education for myself and my students. And I'm sure there are music educators across the state that feel the same way, that feel that they have grown closer to their students through this experience. And it is actually um, invigorated or uh, given us a new perspective or new energy into what we do and has uh, brought credence to what we do uh, as music educators and as choral educators. It really has been the light uh, for many of us at the end of the tunnel, knowing that we still have this way to connect and still have this community that we get to put, pour into as teachers and students. Oh my gosh, that's so fantastic. Um, will you tell us about the student that that was give, that gave you a shout out on the news. And I thought that story was so heartwarming. Will you tell us what was that all about? It was. So in my county, uh, we have some really like out of the box thinkers who came up with this great idea for PGCPS to have a virtual graduation oh, and the news um, wow. on um, WJLA 7. And so uh, students were able to submit thank you videos uh, to be aired during the live graduation. And one of my students, Stephen Day, um, actually did a package, just sent it in and uh, gave me a shout out. Wow. And he was wearing his Bowie High School choir shirt. It was so wonderful. I was so proud. I was like screaming in the living room, like, oh my goodness. It was, it was an amazing experience. But it also lets us know that even though we're not together in the classroom, we are still making an impact on our students. So be encouraged. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what, um, Angelica, um, I've, we've known each other for a little bit of time because you are such a um, uh, an active teacher, right? And you pursue lots of various performance opportunities for your students, of course, mm -hmm. during the traditional time. So Angelica has performed at the Best of Maryland Arts Education Festival. Her students have come several times. Um, we also, when we had the Ma Maryland Masterclass with Donald Lawrence a year ago, mm -hmm. a group of your students came and performed um, and opened for Donald Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So your students are used to high levels of, of performing, right? And you have, of course, many other national and local opportunities for your students. So I'm glad to see that those experiences, while valuable, right? Uh, but this intimate nature of remote learning is bringing you guys closer together because you guys already were a tight knit group. Yes. And that's, yes. I mean, you really were. You have built an incredible rapport with your students is very clear and that you can see the relationship building amongst themselves and with you. So but that's great to hear that the remote learning is not deteriorating that in any way. It's it's amplifying it. Absolutely. So we've been also able to um, and I, I got to be honest, when this first started, it was very difficult to figure out how I was going to take my classroom model, so like this flipped classroom model, and now uh, be basically the the center of attention now in uh, my lessons. Like I would mm -hmm. have to literally be feeding everything. So um, it was a little daunting at first. It was having to learn how to new how to uh, learn how to do brand new software. Um, learning how do I continue to put the power of learning in the hands of the students? You know, uh, giving them the power to continue to push forward with their music education without me having to be the person bringing them along. Right. So one of the ways that I did that was through project-based learning. And so I gave my kids uh, 20 projects that they could do, anything from um, creating a song on GarageBand to being your own conductor, to mm. creating your own um, acapella video. Mm. Um, there ways that students could still grow as musicians during a pandemic and uh, be able to create some authentic experiences for themselves. How are you expressing yourself through music? How are you learning more about music? I've had students who picked an artist, picked an album they had never even heard of before and did an album review. Yes. Oh. Yeah, and gave their feedback on each track. I've had students that created playlists and told me about why they created this playlist, their connection to each song. I've even had a student write me a song, <laughs> which is now What's my name. Who wrote the song? Who, who was the student? Say their I name. Was Brittany Miller. Oh, amazing. Uh, going to be uh, an 11th grader next year at Bowie High School. And he wrote me a song, Bless His Heart. <laughs> now my ringtone. So. Oh. 
That's incredible. That's incredible. So, you know, what's so interesting, um, obviously the, the flipped classroom model is a model that we love to see in an arts classroom, especially in an ensemble space, removing the, the central nature of power. And that can be difficult for teachers to do in a choir setting or in an, a large music ensemble setting. And I, we love that you have you do that and you encourage that. It reminds me a little bit too of some other teachers I've seen like Sarah Lorick down in St. Mary's, who also has this idea of empowering student learners. And, and you know, what's interesting is those are the choirs that receive the, the the best marks at adjudication, right? You yeah. guys are the folks that, um, you know, when you turn the responsibility of learning over to your students. But it's fascinating to see you grapple with how to do that online and persevere and find it. Absolutely. So congratulations to you for that. Thank you, thank you so much. It wasn't easy. I'm but, sure. Uh, we persevere, you know? <laughs> we persevere, we rise to the challenge, and then we adapt. Yes, you guys do. We're And we're grateful, all grateful for it. I have one final question for you. We just have a few minutes left. This summer is such a unique opportunity for us as educators to learn new skills with time, mm -hmm. right? So one of the beautiful, beautiful things that happened this this spring and winter was uh, without a lot of time, teachers. We've heard almost every person on in each panel say, "I had to learn how to do this," and not. And I said, "Oh, it's a lot to learn. Oh well," but I had to learn how to do it, and I did it for the sake of my students and for the continuation of these programs. Um, Arts Together, our report that we've published calls for professional learning that could be leveraged to increase the capacity for remote learning mm -hmm. to digital tools with an arts focus, as well as supporting the whole child through social emotional learning that is integrated fully into the arts space and also looking at culturally responsive arts education as a means of increasing student engagement but also as a means of increase, increasing just like you said those student learning outcomes mm -hmm. so angelica you were the teacher for the year for prince george's county will you tell us this summer hopefully you're resting as well but what are some of the ways you're thinking about <laughs> please do rest but what are some of the ways you're thinking about continuing your learning over the summer what are some things that you um some topics that you're interested in diving into this summer? Well, one, I am uh, just finishing up my admin one certification. So during this, I've been able to uh, actually uh, focus more and have more time to follow through with my admin one certification and I'll be done in the fall. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I've also taken advantage of many of these different outlets that are offering free courses, for example, yeah. for is offering uh, free courses online on how to teach popular music in the classroom, completely free through Coursera. That's great. There are many universities that are offering free courses right now in the very topics in which we are talking about how to be a culturally responsive educator, how to meet the needs and uh, learn about social emotional learning. And this is the time to do it while many of these top universities are offering them for free. Oh, wow. That's such a great resource. Absolutely. To get your certifications, to get your training, so that when you come out of this, not only have you learned how to adjust to all of this, but you now have some certifications under your belt. You now have some training under your belt to not only be a better educator, but to better serve your community. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I love the idea of folks spending some time this summer really thinking about culturally responsive education and also ways to also bring in anti-racist uh, theology, um, I'm sorry, not theology, but theories in place and implementing them through curriculum, through teaching and learning practices. You know, what's the current events in our, in our uh, world right now really demand that we as educators look at ways to allow students to tell their stories and that we dismantle uh, racism in our classrooms and in our programs, mm -hmm. very important. MSD is committed to that. Did you, please, you share something about it. Yes. I was just going to say that um, it's, this is a great turning point in society right now, especially in the field of education, mm -hmm. because there are many underlying layers of um, racism that are interwoven into the education model that many of us really do need to take a step back and think about how we can begin to dismantle some of those practices that we never saw before as putting certain people in a position of privilege while putting mm -hmm. other people in a position uh, that don't have that same privilege. Mm -hmm. 
this is a great time as not just a society, but particularly in education, because we are serving the needs of students, mm -hmm. students of all colors, of all backgrounds. Yes. We as educators need to be educating ourselves on how we can meet those needs better. Absolutely. And I, and I feel very confident, I'm sure you do too, Angelica, that Maryland educators, what I know about Maryland educators is that they are committed to our students. Mm -hmm. And that when they see gaps in their own learning and their own abilities, they are eager to fill them. So I think that is a, a really great call to action. The Maryland State Department of Education this summer is committed to a professional learning committee. I'm, I'm sorry, a personal learning community that's centered in culturally responsive arts education. So mm -hmm. folks that are interested in learning more and working in a cohort with other teachers from across the state, please make sure you are subscribing to our newsletter so you can be one of the first people to sign up for this free professional learning resource that's coming. <laughs> All right. So I, I just want to send us off in style. Um, thank you so much, Angelica, for thank your time. You. I'm going to say goodbye to you. And it was wonderful to see you today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I told you we have the best, the best folks, the best music educators are Maryland music educators. So I just want everyone to remember that fine arts education is a right, not a privilege. And our COVID-19 response is dedicated to expanding opportunities for all students and providing an even more inclusive path forward for all students in vocal music, but also in general music, instrumental music, dance, theater, visual arts, and media arts. In the weeks ahead, we ask you to join us each Friday for a panel discussion here. Uh, we're going through each arts discipline. Next Friday, we have a panel looking at, let me think, mm, next Friday is dance? <laughs> Maybe, visual art. Next Friday is visual art, and the Friday after that is dance, and the Friday after that is theater. So please share that with your other arts education colleagues. Uh, I am so thrilled that we were able to present such a robust discussion um, with you. And, be, and please know that this, this is not the, the last discussion. It is a, 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 just the beginning of ways that we want to be accessible to you and, um, and, and stand before you as uh, we are all planning for the upcoming school year for the fine arts. We are grateful for all of you for your attendance. And please share this, share this, uh, this, this session with your, with your colleagues. Send them here to watch it later. And we look forward to what's next. Michael Bell will be on the panel next Friday for visual art. And Kwanis Floyd from Ames is here, of course. Thank you so much. We are so grateful for all of your support. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>